All right. Hello and welcome to the Expert Inter Insight interview. My name is John Goldham from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Dennis Brower, who is in lovely Northern Virginia. How are you doing, Dennis? I'm doing great. How are you, John? Excellent. And I'm here as usual in the beautiful sunny morning in San Diego. So. Ah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, Dennis is a Cold War Naval flight officer, or was a Cold War Naval uh, flight officer, in-flight safety evaluator, for, and former assistant professor at Texas A&M, and has worked in business for many years in, in cyber networking services. And his speciality is talking nowadays about chaos and how to thrive in chaos. And just before we were going on air, Dennis, we were talking a bit about when you first came out of the the service and you went into business right yeah there were you you uh, business was all about i mean people now you probably have to go to the museum to find them nowadays but you know people <laughs> used to think about you know, talk about five year plans and you were saying even yeah. 11 year plans right right yeah my background was in naval aviation where you, you leave the ship with 4 hours of gas and you get done what you have to do or you run out of gas right you, right so that's sort of the timeline is thinking in terms of hours and it was really eye-opening for me to go into business where there were still a lot of people in the in the 90s who were thinking in terms of you know two, three, five, ten, and as you said, the ultimate 11-year plan, five years of the past, five years of the future, and and this year, and we know across that 11-year plan, things will tweak a little bit, but not really that much. It's 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 changed so much. Yeah. So what we were talking about is clearly anybody watching this now is going to number one, 11-year plan just sounds insane to them. Yeah. But even a five-year plan sounds insane. Nobody does them anymore, quite honestly. I mean, maybe some people do. I don't know. But it, I haven't come across it in a long time. And I've worked with a lot of different organizations. Right. And and as you were saying, we 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 we're in this mode now where everything seems so fluid. It's like we're talking about quarter horizons, even month horizons. Maybe even looking out to the second or third quarter if you really are, uh, if you're really feeling that confident. So yeah. it's kind of reversed. It's almost like we're back to where you were um, as a naval aviator, right? I mean, right. having to deal with with um, uh, constant changes or dramatic things coming out of left field. So I think yeah. people are obviously starting to live in chaos in their work in their work life and not really knowing how to deal with it very well. Right, and that causes a lot of stress when you when you think that this chaos is something that Oh, it just keeps getting worse and I just have to find a way to cope. Well, actually, just coping with things is not a long-term strategy. You've really got to find a way to accept it and to thrive in chaos or it's going to drive you bonkers. Okay, so um, so for anyone listening, they say, okay, uh, I get it. I'm, I'm living in chaos now. There's nothing I can do about it. But thriving in it, that sounds, you know, that sounds difficult. How do I start the process of reorienting my thinking and that to be able to actually embrace chaos as opposed to run away from it. Yeah. So one good example of that is the physical response that we have when things start to really speed up and get really, uh, get really crazy on us. We all have our fight or flight reaction, which mm -hmm. of course is left with us from thousands of generations of, of risk averse ancestors who lived somewhere in the middle of the food chain. They had reason to be uh, terrified mm -hmm. on a regular basis. When we start to feel that, that, that reaction welling up within us as we feel overwhelmed, to just be able to recognize at that point, it's like, okay, that's my body reacting to the stress around me. I don't need to freak out and, and fall into this fight or flight reaction where I'm typically not at my best. I just need to recognize that that reaction is happening. Stop, re-engage my thinking brain and go, okay, what's really important? What's my long-term goal? And long-term might be, what do I need to get done by this afternoon? But what's the most important thing right now? And that's getting a grip on on uh, on that reaction and keeping the thinking part of your brain uh, involved in the moment. Yeah, and I love that point there because I do think that, especially in a work context, is we don't pay enough attention to our physical reactions, our physical and physiological yeah. reactions to things, and we all have triggers and we all have um, physical manifestations of things. And I think to your point if we were a little bit more tuned in, so when something lands on your desk, as you say, God, this has happened, you got to get this sorted immediately or whatever, right. instead of just going with that reaction is analyzing it first for a moment. Yeah, and, and just consciously breaking with mm -hmm. breaking that reaction and, and thinking about it, recognizing it, 
does a lot to just calm us down and get the thinking brain reengaged. You know, so much of what you learn in, in jobs like naval aviation, being mm -hmm. an aviator, is to how to keep thinking in crazy situations, right? Right. So one of the things I, I uh, love to talk about is the Navy decided that one of the great risks to aviators is that you'd eject from your airplane, end up in the water, be picked up by a rescue helicopter, which would then also crash, roll upside down, and sink in the dark. So they have a simulator that trains you how to do that. So if you're unfortunate enough to ever have that happen in the real world, you, you've been through it before, and you can go, I, I, you know, this is extreme, but it's kind of familiar, so I can keep thinking. And as long as you mm -hmm. keep thinking, your chance of, of thriving in that particular chaos, piece of chaos, upside down in the dark with, you know, the world going, falling apart around you, are, your chances are much, much better. So how do you help? How do you help people? I mean, because obviously what you're talking there is an extreme situation. And most people would if and as you say, you're trained for so most people would just shut down immediately. And you see that sometimes in a work environment, even that right. when when things get stressful, people there are people who will you know, step up to it. But there's people who shut down. Yeah, well, um, I, I'd say it's two things. The first is as a leadership coach, when I've talked to people in, in organizations, it's to really have a fresh um, awareness in your mind of what's the most important thing. So hopefully you took a couple of minutes, even at the beginning of the day to say, what's my most important thing today? Mm -hmm. And to be able to go back to that as a touchstone to go, okay, there was, there was a moment at the beginning of the day where things were calm and I had control and to just psychologically revisit that it is a, is a really important thing uh, to do. Mm -hmm. The second thing uh, that I really coach people on is it's okay to have emotions you know, to ask, ask yourself the question, do I have emotions or do my emotions have me? And right. if in the moment you really feel things getting out of control and you, you feel like your emotions are beginning to, to take over, that's when you tend to say and do things that are counterproductive and that you might even regret. And to be able to just take a break, maybe change a subject, maybe to say, you know what, I feel like this is, this is really heating up. Let's see if we can, let's, let's start over. Uh, let's mm -hmm. find a new way to sort of do a reset. And even a few seconds like that can be enough to get that thinking brain reengaged again and calm things down. That, that doesn't, you know, that, that same old boss of mine used to say, let's drain the emotion out of it. Well, it's like, we're not machines. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leadership and team building, uh, you know, teamwork is, is a very high calling for us as humans. And it really demands a lot of us. It also demands we bring our, not just our, 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 our thoughts, but also our feelings and our emotions. So to have that as part of our, Part of those discussions is important it just needs to be in context yeah and it's interesting what you're talking about there because in some ways or many ways it runs counter to the pervasive culture that we live in today because everything is reactive like it's immediately reactive it's react without thinking it's like you, know, you take social media people just like react think, oh, you know, it's fire off yeah 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 and and even to even what you were saying or even that idea of taking a few moments at the beginning of the day to focus and prioritize. It's almost like people have lost the ability to do that because they're just so used to reacting in everything that they just like pile into the day and then just react, react, react. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a key distinction between being reactive and being responsive. We mm -hmm. all want to be responsive yeah. and you can be super hyper responsive, mm -hmm. but it still implies a level of thoughtfulness that reacting yes. doesn't, you know, that fight or flight lizard brain, part of us reacts before it considers anything because it's just like, hey, look, the building's falling down. Something bad is, something really bad is happening. The saber tooth tiger is jumping on my mm -hmm. back. I need to just react. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty rare. So then how do you, okay, so th that's one strategy is obviously taking a few moments at the beginning of the day is to prioritize and focus. And I know these are really hard things for a lot of people to do, because I said, every, yep. they're so distracted today, everybody's distracted. The next thing is, how do you, how do you help people or retrain people to, when something happens or chaos comes up, rather than to fear it, sort of embrace it as an opportunity to, you know, I can handle this. I can excel here. I know what I'm doing. Well, um, it, it's a it's a very timely question. Actually, just two days ago, I spent a 12 hour shift in an intensive care unit at the University wow. of Virginia, not as a patient, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, but as an observer. My daughter is, was the charge nurse that day, mm -hmm. who was really kind of the the mid level manager, making sure that uh, everything went right that day. And what I observed there was very much like what I observed in. Uh, aviation training and survival training, where as you step into things to go, all right, so let's just take a second here. As we go into this, this is the way we're approaching this. 
and this is the outcome we expect. Now, it might go this way or that way. And in that case, we're, you know, we're, we've got strategies that we can fall back on for that as well. And at the end of each one of those kind of high intensity interactions, um, to also take a moment to go, all right, did that turn out the way you thought it would? What'd you pick up from that? What's the one thing you take away from that? And it's a way to just, uh, it's a way for that active part of your brain that's just immersed in everything and wants to react, to stop for a moment and sort of learn a little lesson from it. It's kind of a micro celebration in the moment. It might be learning, and people, we love to talk about learning from failure. It might be learning from success too, right? Mm -hmm. it really cement that learning that happened and put it in context. So again, just breaking stride for a moment is often enough to do it so that you're ready to hit the next thing, uh, you know, fully engaged. Yeah, because I, I love I love that bit about learning from it because I do feel that I, I worked at a company one time where the the senior management were fantastic crisis management guys. They oh, would yeah. when when there was a crisis with a big customer or something happened with the company, they'd all come together and they'd all be excited and they get it. But they never learned from any of those experiences. Nothing ever happened afterwards to ensure that those things didn't happen yeah. again. They just could come together and have another. So that idea of, of learning from each of these experiences and, and being able to mitigate a little better in future, I think that's a critical piece that probably not a lot of people are doing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so exciting to ride the fire truck and turn the sirens yeah. on and go screaming down the road. And when you're done to go, wow, we're an awesome firefighting uh, yeah. unit here. But then to stop and have somebody raise their hand and go, yeah, but why do we have so many fires? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If we didn't have to roll the truck as much and go barreling down mm -hmm. the highway. Um, and that that is a hallmark of highly successful organizations. They really do ask that question of why are we so good at controlling these disasters and getting customers back on track and, and the you know the ninth inning save? Why are we so good at that? Um, how can how can we win these games in the third inning instead? Right. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. Now? Yeah, it's, it is. And it's like any any sport or if you have a favorite team in whatever sport, there's nothing more frustrating is when they kick into gear with 10 minutes to go and you're like, why right. can't you play like that? for the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the other? So um, how do you when you when you talk to people, how do you help them? like organizations understand that, yes, everything is moving really rapidly. Yes, there's short uh, time horizons now for everything, but you still have to take time out to do a little bit of planning, to learn a little, to be a little bit more deliberate in everything you do. And, and I believe it's not like you don't have the time. We do say we're busier than we've ever been, but I always say, no, we're more distracted than we've ever been. If you yeah. removed a couple of distractions, you've got the time. So how do you help people and organizations learn how to set aside a little time to be deliberate? Um, well, the first thing is everybody thinks their organization and their level of busyness slash distraction is unique. And of course yes. it's not, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's across almost every kind of organization in every industry and, and almost every job function from sales to operations to finance, everybody feels that way. So the mm -hmm. first thing that I like to do is to say, I get that. I mean, I've got a 20 year career in IT services bought by a couple of telecoms right. and everybody felt that way about what they were doing. But honestly, there are teams out there who really are in those kinds of environments every day. There are people who, and I, I continue to go back to the medical um, yeah. field, they're and, and, and aviation. There are people who are literally working in fields where they make life and death decisions yes. every day. And the, the consequences are immediate, irreversible, and frequently tragic, potentially mm -hmm. tragic. So there, there are people who think that way all day long because they, 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 they have to. The alternative yeah. is unthinkable. And I remind them that for people in those kinds of roles, they've got a very specific way of thinking about things. The first thing they do is face the problem and own the problem and understand the problem. Really make, have you asked that question? What are we here to do? What, what are we trying to solve? And that can be, that can take 15 or 20 seconds. It can take a couple of days at an offsite to, to just deal with that part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the second part is to de deliberately plan your response, at least your immediate response. But I'd I really like to coach people to ask a question of, Okay, you're pretty sure that's going to happen, but it's based on a bunch of assumptions. What if a couple of those assumptions aren't aren't right, and you get a different outcome? Have you planned for other potential outcomes? Anticipated what could go wrong? So, if I can get people to do that, to just clarify the problem they think they're solving instead of leaping to a solution, 
to uh, go through at least some trivial discussion around how they want to respond to that and then uh, and begin to and think about and maybe actually vocalize what they think could go wrong gives them a lot of that, that's actually far more preparation than most people do as they approach problems mm -hmm. and simply being prepared. I mean, you, you know, this being in a CRM company, if you've had that discussion before you go in on a sales call, you feel better, more confident, and you're much likelier to not only have a better outcome on, on the far end of it, but also to respond in a more fluid and relevant manner as objections come up and, it, and, you, and you really start to understand things that you didn't know about when you came in. Yeah. So, and, 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 I, and I love and I love that point. Well, there's a couple of points there that I just wanted to draw a line under because they're very important. Um, absolutely, what you're saying, there are jobs where life is on the line. Thankfully, majority of jobs, that isn't the case. And I often like to say when things are getting too heated or when something happens, I always love to say, well, nobody died today. Okay. Yeah. And and if we and if we don't get this right first time, nobody's going to die, right? Yeah. Let's try it. So let's just, you know, dial it back yeah. a little bit. Um, the second thing is is one is that the thing you you pointed out there is this jump to solution, and that is such a so many people are so tempted that the minute you say something they jump to solution mode yeah. without really understanding what the problem is. Well, and the real warning phrase for me there it's amazing how how quickly this comes up and how well it holds up is as soon as someone who's at a higher level or outside the business function says why don't you just yeah. With a solution after it, they're almost always wrong. It, that is a nearly 100% indicator of a trivial understanding of what the, what the organization is trying to solve. Because it's just like, okay, we tried that three years ago and two years ago, and it's just that didn't work. We need some fresh ideas here. So why don't you just is a real warning phrase. Yeah, and the other thing you um, you mentioned there is this uh, assumptions, and I do think this is this is something that we're all guilty of that we all have to be careful of and and always and watch out for, and and it's a lesson that we, uh, you know, has a habit of slapping us in the face on a regular basis to yeah. remind us that uh, yeah, you made an assumption. <laughs> so how do, so uh, so what are some of the ways that people can avoid that? Because it's such a natural tendency is just to, and it's kind of lazy as we know, but you just go oh, okay. I'll, this this will probably this is probably how it'll play out. Well, you know, unfortunately, it comes back to uh, confirmation bias, mm -hmm. where we we tend to interpret the world around us to fit the bias to fit our prior experience, mm -hmm. um, and people tend to think of confirmation bias now in a political context. You know, sure. the yeah. confluence of political um, mm -hmm. content and social media is like the worst slash yes. best example of confirmation mm -hmm. bias. So if you can get people to understand that they bring to any to any problem, any situation, their perspective, and their perspective probably warps the reality in some way. And to, again, just step back for a moment and go, all right, so what are my assumptions coming into this? And people, if they're, if they're asked, can typically state them, uh, but you'll see them do kind of what you're doing right now to go, um, yeah, what did I assume there? And then they can mm -hmm. rattle off. But once they rattle them off, they become more aware of them. And that, of course, then is the key to saying which one of those could be wrong. And if one of those, a big one is wrong, um, how's that going to impact what we have to do in the next few few seconds or minutes? So Yeah, because let's face it, what is that, that famous saying? It's like, it's not what you don't know that gets you. It's what you, what you know for sure that just ain't so or whatever it is. It, it, yeah, it's what you think you know that isn't so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. So um, it, as we wrap up here, um, Dennis, what are some other small pieces of advice you would give to people, given the fact that this, this chaotic world that we live in today is likely not getting any less chaotic anytime mm -hmm. soon. Um, what are some tips where people can really um, excel in it and not, not be so maybe overwhelmed by it? Uh, well, the, the thing I go back to is, you know, from my time in naval aviation, what I learned there is there's a system that was built up be, because of catastrophic losses mm -hmm. um, af after World War II in Korea, where They've actually lost more. They lost seven times as many airplanes in the first year of peacetime as they lost in the greatest carrier battle of all time. Wow. What they found was that there were all these assumptions that had been made about how you'd operate an aircraft, the fact that you can't have a safe aviator and an aggressive aviator because they were considered to, to be um, in opposition. There were these basic, basic assumptions that, that forced 
false either or alternatives on a business. So what I really like to, to encourage pe people and leaders to do is to examine those things that within their business that they think are in conflict. This is a conflict. We can't provide great service and be a low cost provider. It's like, well, of course you can. Mm -hmm. People do it right. all the time. And maybe maybe 10 or 20 years ago, that was was impossible and maybe it's still difficult, but your competitors are doing it now. So you need to find a way to take those either ors and turn them into and and yes, we can um, opportunities. So anytime you can do that, that's great. I think the likelihood of you being able to do that and, and instead of just failing quickly to succeed quickly in small increments is to use some of the scrum methodology, you know, that software right. development teams use mm -hmm. and really get the input of everybody on the team. People on the whole team have to be willing to say not just, hey, I see a problem, let's stop, but I see an opportunity. Let's consider this as another way we can redirect this thing. Uh, so that in a chaotic environment, we're correcting our actions very quickly. To the outside observer, we look very fluid and we'll end up with success much more rapidly and to a much greater degree than we would if we took a that much, you know, that, that slower, more pedantic 11-year approach. <laughs> yeah. Oliver, just putting my uh, pipeline and CRM hat on for a moment, we do use Scrum methodology and have a Scrum master and all of that stuff. And it yeah, really sure. does, it really does help with uh, being able to build a superior superior software yeah. so listen dennis before we go uh all of your information will be in your bio uh attached to this but before we go i'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do okay yeah great uh you know my background is a combination of naval aviation for eight years final three years that i was a professor at texas a&m but i spent the 26 years after that uh, leading product development organizations and then sales and marketing kind of on the side so what i do now is i go out and speak and consult on, with organizations on how to become more agile and responsive uh, by learning from, you know, learning from teams in danger, those teams that that live in life and death situations. And I've got sort of an inter interesting tweak on that. Uh, my daughter and I have just uh, uh, agreed that we're going to be doing a father daughter speaking engagement as well, where I can come in with the military and IT background, and she comes in with the high intensity healthcare and uh, ICU perspective. And the overlaps and the contrasts between the industries and the generational aspect are really interesting. So just out there trying to get people thinking and doing some really new and exciting things to help them become more effective and competitive in the world. Yeah, I love that. It's a great idea, Ben, uh, Dennis, because it's, uh, I think we have the most generations in the workforce that we've ever had before. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So, and that, and we could talk, that's a whole other subject area. Sure. <laughs> but this has been great. So listen, Dennis, thank you very much for talking with us today. And remember, big takeaway for anybody watching, look out for those either ors in your organization. That's a good place to start uh, looking at things. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.